Hi, a little bit of pre-chat here. Um, super excited to be back for season three. Yes. Oh, we got an extra special guest as well. His name is Johan Harry. He's a journalist. He's got many books out. You can find them in the links below. He is also the executive producer of the film United States versus Billy Holiday. He also wrote it. He's super talented and just a delight to sit down and talk with. I first heard him on the Joe Rogan experience. So for him to be on this podcast is absolutely amazing. So this episode is a special, as it's the first one of Series 3, and of course, because it's with you and Harry. But just to warn you that there is a bit of language in it from the beginning and all the way through. So maybe listen to this when the kids are away. You've been warned. We recorded this podcast back in December 2020 when times were a little different. Anyway, let's get on with the podcast. It is an absolute wonderful addition, so please enjoy. And let us know what you think. Let's start. Hello, 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 hello. Oh my god, season three. I cannot believe it. Um, anyway, this is Best Thing. We are back, yes, for season three. Very excited. We've got some amazing guests coming up. And today's guest is a great one to kick season three off. Let's say season three even more. Yes, his name is Joanne Harry, and he is a journalist. He has done some incredible things, got some wonderful books out. And if you want to find out more about him, all the stuff will be in the links below, as always. We've got Adam Harris with his fat chicken, Bethia Beach bring us the best in brand new music, and of course, film bag, the boys Tom and the Reverend, making sure we don't miss out on those films. Now, I have to say, this is an extra long episode, so definitely get in the mood for this one. This is Best Thing, and enjoy. Next up, Adam Harris's fat chicken, followed by interview with Johan Harry. Cluck, cluck, y'all. Uh, fat chicken here. Did you know I'm allergic to cats? A lot of people are allergic to cats, but apparently some cats can be allergic to people. I'm going to find out if that's true for you at the end of this dross. I've tried to set up as well as I can, but you invited me to your office, which is lovely. There's loads of books around, um, and you've made me a, a cup of tea. What more can you ask? Well, probably loads <laughs> more. I quite mean. a lot, to be fair. <laughs> but the, it is quite a shit room, but you know. <laughs> it's fine. You've got a fan in here. There's a bin, and we had some flat Diet Coke. Exactly. You couldn't ask for any more. Well, literally, you can't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Uh, Johan, how are you doing? I mean, you could ask for more, but you're not getting it. So. Uh, there's Just a scented for- candle. There is a sense of And candy. like a posh, like, lamp. It's true. My friend brought me this, and I have never lit it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a housewarming. I mean... Uh, office warming. I'm already off topic, but people buy me candles, and I get to get told off about this. But if they buy me two posh candles, I will never light them. Uh, do you think do they make you self-conscious? I just feel like I might not ever get one again, so I just want to keep it in my house. See, my mum's from Glasgow. That's where I was born. And... Uh, my mum thinks that I'm like hilariously posh. So like, she thinks my whole voice, they moved here when I was a baby. So to her, everything about me. So I remember one time about, let's see, a couple of years ago, she phoned me and I said, oh, mum, I can't talk. I'm just walking from my therapist to my personal trainer. And she said, son, I'm sorry to tell you this. You've become a cunt. <laughs> and so like, whenever she wants to impersonate me, she goes, ya, ya, ya. Yeah, 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 yeah. So does she think you're just posh? Is that what we're saying? Oh, like ridiculously posh. Once I, um, and English as well, which is much even worse than being posh for her. So when I, years ago, I was in New York, I was covering the uh, Republican National Convention in New York. And for a play on the Sting song, I called myself in the article, an Englishman in New York. Fair. Mum phoned me the next day, she's like, no fucking son of mine as an Englishman. You've forgotten what they fucking did to Mel Gibson, you cunt. She was so... And, like she thinks, by the way, Mel Gibson is innocent of anti-Semitism. Even when I played that, she said the English have planted this. I'm like, what? The English have constructed an actor to play Mel Gibson of and course. say anti-Semitic things. They fucking have. <laughs> Don't you fucking insult him. So yeah, it's very unfortunate. So when um, when the um, when COVID first happened, about a month in, she sent me a, an email and it said, "Oh, you're really good in this speech." And it was, I thought, oh, that's nice. She's watched something I've done. I clicked the link. It was the fucking queen talking about Corona and going like, oh, 
<laughs> my sympathies to you all. So yeah, to her, I'm like ludicrously posh. It's about listening to your voice back, which is a thing that we both have to do quite a lot. I've had to start editing my own podcast because um, we lost uh, our, our sponsorship. So I've been doing it. So sorry if the, the audio is not being... Actually, my friend said it sounded the same. So I felt like, oh. But you've got quite a posh voice as well. It's because I went to drama school. Right. That's so interesting. I find it interesting. People who are... Um, sort of class imposters slightly, or not class imposters, people who've, m- who've moved. Uh, I find that a really interesting phenomenon because when I watch um, uh, my home videos, it's really weird. I mean, they're kind of horrific for all sorts of reasons. My family was insane, but the, <laughs> but it's it's so odd. So my mum's got this very strong Scottish accent. My dad has this extremely strong Germanic accent. His English is very poor. Like even now, he'll make basic mistakes. We went to Brent Cross a while back and. He said, where is the toilet? I want to shit myself. And I said, no, no, dad, you want to shit? He said, yes, I am myself. I want to shit. I want to shit myself. He just couldn't understand the mistake. So, you know, so he's got a very strong Germanic accent. My brother and sister have got the accents of the place we lived in, Edgware, which is a kind of, um, <clears throat> you know, kind of like working class, you know, like kind of estuary English. And I'm like fucking Stewie from Family Guy from the moment I try. So my mum's going like, your hand, come over here. And I'm like, certainly, mother. I'd be delighted to. And my dad's like, what is he saying? What does it mean? And my sister's going, shut the fuck up. And it's just, yeah, so it's this weird. I, don't, I think the thing about a lot of gay kids have posher voices in their families. I've noticed that. Uh, Even before I would have had any concept that I was gay, I have this weird posh voice yeah. do you realize and this is we haven't even started yet but it's cool i like the, the we call it a soft opening um <laughs> <laughs> but i was hoping for a soft opening from the daniel and we got there earlier than i expected very early right at the beginning like, but other people know you're gay before you do did you find that weird that other people will point out to you if you ask nearly anyone did someone say oh you're gay or a girls were just like yeah we kind of trust you because you know i know that you're not going to hurt me right. that they no, inherently no, before we even, and it's nothing to do with being sexual, it's nothing to, they, ju- people just are what they are, and it's so weird that other people will tell you before you know, or you accept it. That's so interesting, why do you think that is, what are they picking up on? Different, I think as soon as there's any kind of difference, or, you know, uh, and uh, to the norm, and I think with the norm is, it changes a lot, but I think that, I think Especially girls know, ah, you're not going to attack me. Huh. You know so what I mean? It's a vibe of safety. Yeah. I think we all have that in different contexts. Like there are times when, um, so I've been, uh, I'm not going to talk about it very much, but I'm working on a book at the moment about um, Las Vegas and partly about um, something that's been happening about homelessness in Las Vegas, which I'm not meant to talk about. My publishers we won't talk about it, it's fine. But there's... But, but what I can say about it is this, it's really interesting. So you obviously I'm spending a lot of time in, in what a lot of people would regard as dangerous situations in Vegas. I've just come back from there uh, a few weeks ago. And it's very interesting that because even so with the range of people there, you can tell very early on who you're safe with and who you aren't. Yeah. Right. And I suppose it must be something analogous to that. I mean, a, a subtler vibration of that. Right. Mm-hmm. Where we're always. Yeah. That's, I had never thought of it as a thing about safety because I think my dad it's because we're boys, that's why. I don't well, think we'd we'll notice as much. Say that again? Because we're boys. I don't think we'd notice as much. Mm. I think that the girls just have this inherent, like, I can trust you. Like, that's you can be in my, you know, if you think about theatre and stage and stuff, like, people just getting their clothes off all the time. Because in, in some sort of format, it sort of means nothing. But majority of people in theatre, not everyone, but majority of people in theatre may be part of the LGBTQ plus community. So that's, they're like, oh, I don't care. You know what I mean? That there's just a, but if there was just, a load of like straight blokes there. I don't know if they feel the same of doing That's that. That's so interesting. I think that my dad said to me that he he um, knew I was gay from when I was very very young. Mm-hmm. I'm very. I was saying before right now. I'm very lucky with my dad because my dad is quite homophobic. <laughs> Fortunately, he hates women more than he hates gay met people. So <laughs> he said to me once, "Ah, son, it is good you're a faggot. It means you don't have to deal with these bitches." I was like, "Oh, thanks, dad. That's really sweet." <laughs> That's lovely. And Say get out again. into the world. Um, exactly. so, Johan, let's, uh, let's get into this. Oh, sorry, um, yes. No, it's fine. I like that. I told you, it's a soft we, opening. We've offered your soft opening. And <laughs> we're gonna, Seven we're gonna minutes plow in. deeper plow in. Plow deeper in. And we're talking food. Um, so, are you a breakfast eater? Do you like breakfast? Do you eat breakfast? Do, you want, do I want to say breakfast anymore? So breakfast. I, I have, so, I have this... Um, to understand my relationship with food, I think you have to understand this terrible thing that... <laughs> terrible experience that happened to me in on Christmas Eve 2009 so um 11 years ago I used to live on Brick Lane just off Brick Lane in the East End 
and I went to my local KFC for lunch. And the guy behind the counter said to me when I went in, I said my standard order, which is so disgusting, I won't even repeat it. And he said, oh, yeah, and I'm really glad you're here. Just wait a minute. And he went off and I was like, that's weird. And he came back with all the members of staff who were on that day and a massive Christmas card <laughs> in which they'd written to our best customer and everyone had signed it and they'd written little in Where were jokes. you living? Where were you living then? It was, sorry? Where were you living then? In, in, in East London. So a very busy establishment of KFC. A very, <laughs> very busy branch of KFC. I was not only their best customer. They, they, one of the reasons my heart sank is I thought to myself, this isn't even the fried chicken shop I come to the most, right? <laughs> so anyway, I could never go back to that branch of KFC. And about two years later, I bumped into that guy in the, just in the street. And he said, oh, Johan, you didn't come back. We, we assumed you must have had a heart attack. I was like, fuck off. <laughs> so it was very unfortunate. So my relationship with food is problematic in that um, uh, I was really raised uh, on junk food, right? My, I was basically raised by my grandmother because my mum was quite ill when I was a kid and my dad was mostly in a different country. And um, so she had, you know, Scottish working class um, diet of the uh, woman of her generation, which was basically chips, right? Like it was chips, Finder's crispy pancakes. Big so fan. all of Big my fan. like um, uh, taste, uh, so taste, taste buds, not in a literal sense, but like, you know, the things that you think was come to were, uh, grew up around really unhealthy, unhealthy food um and yeah i mean it's, it, it i mean it's just what kids say isn't it like if you go to a kid's party yeah. isn't it just fish fingers and chips and yeah yeah except that was the soul crisps. like it was like living at a children's party is that what you lived with? infinitely right so like it was so um do you eat healthy now so i've had phases where i go in and out so i had periods of really really poor eating and then i get better um and then it gets worse again. So, for example, I've just been in Vegas for two months. You, you just cannot eat well in Las Vegas. No, right? you can't. I mean, you could eat, you know, there are, I mean, <laughs> it was really funny when I looked on Uber Eats just before, um, when I arrived. And I looked at the healthy option. And the first thing that came up in the healthy option was Popeye's chicken. I was like, yeah. Okay, that's Vegas healthy, right? So uh, it is good there. I mean, I yeah. don't, I don't eat oh meat. Oh my god! But it you is know, good. I had a terrible epiphany about. So you know, Chick Fil A is the it, Chick. So p for people who don't know, Chick Fil A is a um, popular fried chicken. We had one in Redding. It got closed down. What? Though. Yeah. How could I have not known this? Yeah, we had one in Reading. It closed down. No, why did it close down? What because the fuck is wrong with the people of Reading? The LGBT community. Well, you see, this is the that. terrible thing. So basically, so Chick Fil A is a, a chain of really, really amazingly delicious fried chicken, and then um, it must be about five years ago, maybe a bit longer. It was revealed that they. This is before the Supreme Court ruling that introduced gay marriage all over the US. There were referendums across the country about whether to introduce gay marriage in the individual states. And Chick-fil-A that has some bigoted owner and they funded the anti-gay campaigns. Mm -hmm. So there was a gay boycott and people who were in favor of gay equality boycotted Chick-fil-A. And I was like, oh God, I can't eat Chick-fil-A anymore. It's terrible. But you wanted and to. I, but I realized <laughs> actually the two core parts of my character were at war, the gay part and the love of fried chicken. Like, do I love cock more than I love fried chicken, right? <laughs> Which and, one do you go actually, for? Which one do you care? Fried, fried chicken, chicken prevailed. Yeah, I was the, gonna say. The literal cock prevailed over the- Also, the just because people have an idea about stuff doesn't mean that you can't, I don't know. It's, 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 it's such it, good it, fried chicken. If it was even 5% less good, I ate that- significantly less than otherwise would have but every did time get, i was did like did you get a christmas card from them or a birthday card sadly not no. sadly not we but then, so yeah my my um so my relationship with food, I, I had i quite badly i would say <laughs> <laughs> is there any food that you don't eat is there anything you're not liking what you're not liking food wise um yeah because sometimes you we well, actually had a peter pan so we don't like certain things like olives and red wine well there was something that happened this year that i didn't like so i got it was about three weeks into the lockdown. I got a message on Facebook from someone I hadn't seen since I was 16 or 17. And she said, oh, yeah, can I, can I call you? I'm like, all right. So she calls me, someone I was good friends with. We just kind of drifted apart, as you do when you're that age, sometimes. And she said, I've been really worried about you. And I said, oh, why? She said, I don't know if you remember, but when we were like 16, we watched some film about the end of the world. And we all sat around and we talked about what's the point in the collapse of civilization where you would just be like, I'm going to kill myself. I can't go on. And you said, 
it's when they stop filming Coronation Street in EastEnders and they shut all the branches of KFC and McDonald's. And then suddenly I realised that has actually happened. It has happened. So are you okay? And I was like, fuck off, I'm fine. I'm, I'm like, fine. But yeah, so the closure of KFC and McDonald's was a deep trauma to me. But um, there are, oh, there's lots of food I don't like. I don't like... Um, uh, I mean, most food I don't like. Are you picky? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, basically anything that's not a carb... I'm like, why would I eat this? You know? So, like salad, for example. I mean, I wish it well. Yeah. Other, I mean, you have a healthy glow. I can tell you eat salad. I'm glad that it's giving only, you this healthy only, glow. Only in a wrap. I don't, I don't know if I eat salad all the time. Like, I'll have, like, loads of salad in a wrap that I put in. That's my new diet. I've just been eating wraps all the time. I, ra- I, I improved my diet massively when I moved to New York about, uh, got 10 years ago now. Well I done. I mean, that's not easy. Well, you can, sort of New Yorkers, you get into a... You get into a competitive dynamic in New York because everyone looks good. So actually, you feel like a right fat cunt, even if you're a bit overweight. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So actually, you you get into this. So that was the kind of... That was a period of my life where probably most healthy in that I ate really healthily. And there's lots of nice healthy options in New York. I used to live across the street from a place called Fuel in House Kitchen. They did... Uh, like. I broke my heart last time I was in New York. They've shut down that branch. It's still one other one, but it's um, in Midtown. And um, yeah, because that was really delicious, healthy food. And I basically never found an equivalent to that anywhere that else in the world. I hate when that happens. You're yeah. like, oh, I've, I, this is it. This is all I need to eat there's for the rest chain, of my life. Uh, there's a chain in Australia. What's it called? My friend Hermione, who's my publicist, uh, publicist in Australia, introduced me to it. I can't remember what it's called, but there's an unbelievably delicious, healthy food chain in in Australia as well. Um, so yeah, but but healthy food is hard to come by. Uh, and delicious healthy food is hard to come by. It is, it very much is. I mean, I think there's, I don't know, they put all these sort of Marks and Spencer kind of versions of, you know, deliciously healthy. and But you're just adding sort of words on top of it, is it? I don't, if, yes. I, if I eat five, the worst thing is when I get a salad from like M&S or anywhere else, or the, you know, um, and I eat the whole salad, like, oh, it's superly healthy. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's 400 calories per quarter. <laughs> I've just eaten the whole thing. Yeah. On what basis is this? That really deceptive labeling of calories is like, where you look at it, go, oh, 200 calories. That's great. Perfect. And then you're like, oh, 200 calories per tenth of the fucking. Just, look, just looking at yeah, it, exactly, 200 calories. Exactly. You become morbidly obese if you look at it five times. I have no idea where I'm going to go with this, but what is the best thing for food of, for you? What What is it like fried chicken, would you say? Is that still the thing that you, is your go to? So I have this kind of weird lost utopia, which is, I don't know if you remember, I think we're the same age, aren't we? And I think you're a little bit younger than me. I'm 41. But you still look about 28. Oh, thank so you. The, I'm just saying. The, okay. How old are you, Daniel? Uh, 38. So I think you you might remember this. Do you remember the McPizza? <laughs> Do you remember the McPizza? So is that the best thing I think food? it was the best thing. So I've never really recovered from the cancellation of the McPizza. So I remember it really vividly. Um, I've never heard that answer before. I was like, oh, the taste and the colour. If I was on death row, I would say, fucking get me a McPizza, track it down. So, and I was about to be executed. So, the, the I mean, even if I was just on death row and they were keeping me alive, I'd beg for one, but I doubt they'd bring it. The, so, the McPizza, for people who don't remember, because there'll be younger viewers who don't remember this, there was a, a, a brief utopian moment in human history in the early 1990s where McDonald's sold pizza, obviously, the McPizza. And I remember... I remember so vividly me and my friend Alex going into the, the McDonald's in Edgware where I grew up after school one day and I said, oh, I'll have a McPizza. And when behind the counter said, you can't have a McPizza. And I said, oh, are you, are you out of stock? And she said, no, they've been discontinued. And I said, oh, so you mean this branch won't be selling McPizza anymore? She's like, no, no branches sell it anymore. It, it's gone. And I said, in the manner of, you know, like the stages of grief, I was like well, bargaining. Oh, that can't be right. There must still be... Some in the back. The, There's some like, in the back. Yeah, Come so, on. Well, there's one in the West End. Oh, there must be a branch in the West End that sells them. She's like, no, no, no. They've, they've been discontinued. And I, in my memory, this can't be actually how it happened. But I like... You know those moments in films where everything goes into slow motion and you sink to your knees and go, no! That's what I did. And I think, in a way, my life has never recovered from that. Uh, I'm already going to make a meme out of this uh, so, audio. That was my foundational trauma. Anyway, and... um, uh. Someone pointed out to me um, about a year ago that there is one last place in Pennsylvania that still does the McPizza. So I've been meaning to go on a pilgrimage. I was near Pennsylvania not long ago. And um, someone has done, I haven't listened to it yet, but someone has done 
a 100 part podcast about the McPizza where they try to understand what happened. Apparently, it's semi satirical. <laughs> But it's going to so, be a Netflix documentary. Soon, it isn't will it? be exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I would say the McPizza is my. I think we'll, I think we'll go with that. Um, also, there's um, I was in LA um, uh, not too long ago, and there, there's a place for anyone who's planning to go to LA when the plague ends. There's um, a place called Salt's Cure in in Hollywood that does pancakes that are literally because normally American pancakes are like thick, fluffy. They're not what we think of as pancakes, yeah, right? Because we have the thinner ones, exactly. Yeah. But they do the thinner pancakes, but they're literally, like, if Jesus returned in the form of a pancake, he would be this pancake, right? (laughs) It's like, I've never eaten, it was staggering how delicious these pancakes were. I I actually cried with happiness. Um, So I would recommend Salt's Cure Pancakes. I'll I'll, I'll put it in the link below. Um, So I'm going to say for Johan, the the best thing about food is a McPizza and then slash uh, these wonderful pancakes from Salt's Cure. Exactly. I like that. You were were just talking about travel, so we're going to come into that. Um, We're going to be talking about the best thing about travel for Johan. I'm still getting over the McPizza. Um, wow. That sounds amazing. Sorry, I got lost in the dream then. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you are well travelled. You have been a lot of places. You've done a lot of things. Um, let's go with this one. Where haven't you been? Galapagos. <laughs> have you been to the Galapagos? No, I've never been to Galapagos. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think of other places. Madagascar. I've never been to Madagascar. I've seen the several films, uh, the animated <laughs> So I feel like I, which I understand are documentaries. Of course they are. Yeah, exactly. Like the crown. So, so the, basically, the crowns are documentaries exactly, as well. Exactly. Crown. No, um, the crown is just hidden footage that was shot in Buckingham Palace. People talk to me like it's real. We can't talk about majesty. this now because we, we'll get onto that in the next category. But um, yeah, okay. So where was the last place that you that you went and you were like, this is where I could stay for like a couple of months to like a year? So j- I actually just before. Uh, in fact, I got in just under the wire. I had to go to Moscow for um, to research something for one of my next books. So I was in Moscow just prior to the lockdown. And just before that, I was in Iceland. And they're both places I'd never been before. And um, in very different ways, they both kind of blew my mind. But um, it's funny because for me, I travel... Um, so... As you, obviously, as you know, I, I write books, and for me, I, I, I travel about half the year uh, researching my books, and then the other half of the year I write. And so I'm always going to really, really different kinds of places. And for me, travel is mostly about meeting people, right? So some people massively get off on landscapes and things, and I, you know, I can be moved by nature, but mostly for me, it's about people and meeting people and finding people and learning stories about people and seeing connections between things. So my my response to a place is very much guided by, you know, who I find, where I find them, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, so so that that's a very important... So for example, one thing, um, you know, that I, I, I write about in Lost Connections that really um, kind of deeply affected me actually, and, and I think about all the time, is... Um, a group of people that I met in, in Berlin. Um, so Berlin is a kind of important place for me anyway. It's um, My mum and dad lived there for a long time. Um, I, I love Berlin. I think it's an incredible... Have you been, Daniel? I have, yeah. Yeah, did it it's, blow your mind? Yeah, I did. It's Though completely I, I, I got a three star for my Uber rating because they dropped me at a gay bar. It really annoyed me. And then I watched the Black Mirror thing and I was like, oh, like, I'm only, I don't know, what, what do you have know. an Uber rating? Are you sure it's a gay bar or just were you just a cunt to the, the driver? <laughs> were you like... Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, I was. I was Rouse. <laughs> exactly. You were just shouting abuse at him. In no, German. but I did. I did love. I did love Berlin. Uh, we cycled around and stuff. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, but. the the. I think with Berlin, you know, it's funny the the, because I wrote this book about depression, and obviously, you know, I was trying to understand why depression and anxiety have gone up so much, and, and what we can do about that. And and I think I actually learned the answers, uh, and obviously I learned them partly from, you know, mainly in some ways from the leading scientists in the world on these questions. And I learned the scientific evidence that there's nine different causes of depression and anxiety and that I met people all over the world who are building solutions to those problems. But actually, I think the people who taught me most were not those scientists and doctors, or rather, 
what those scientists and doctors taught me only really fell into place when I met this group of people in Berlin. Can I tell you their story? Because I think it will help. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. So yeah. in the summer of 2011, on a big anonymous council estate in Berlin, a Turkish-German woman called Nuria Cengiz climbed out of her wheelchair and she put a sign in her window. She lived on the ground floor, a ground floor flat. And the sign said something like, I got a notice saying I'm going to be evicted next Thursday. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to kill myself. Right. Now this housing project, wow. it's called Cotty. And it's, um, you know, uh, like a lot, like a council estate in Britain, you know, quite anonymous. No one really knew anyone. Not every state's like that, obviously, but a lot of them are. Um, and, and it had always been a kind of poor area. It's in, it's in, it, for a long time, it had been a poor area. And there were basically three kinds of people who lived on this estate. There were recent Muslim immigrants, like this woman, Nuria. <clears throat> there were gay men and there were punk squatters. And as you can imagine, these three groups didn't get along very well, but really no one knew anyone, right? So, um, and, and rents were rising rapidly all over Berlin, but they were particularly rising quickly in this area. It was gentrifying really fast. It's part of a Kreuzberg, which I'm sure you went to mm -hmm. when you were there. Yeah. Um, and so people start to walk past Nuria. You know, she lives on the ground floor. People see the sign in a window. No one knows her. They're like, oh, this is really bad. So people knock on her door. They're like, do you need any help? And Nuria said, fuck you. I don't want any help. I'm going to kill myself, right? So people start talking outside her door. They're like, this is really bad. This woman's going to kill herself. And, 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 and they were all pissed off that their rents were going up. A lot of people were being evicted. Nuria wasn't unusual. And, they, and everyone was worried that they were going to be evicted because rents had gone up so much. And they worried they might not be able to afford it anymore. And one of them just had an idea. There's a big thoroughfare that runs through Cotty that goes into the centre of Berlin, into Mitte. And one of them has this idea. They just said, you know, if on Saturday we block the road for a day and we have a protest. Um, the media will probably come. There'll be a little bit of a fuss. Um, they might let Nuria stay in her home. There might even be some pressure to stop our rents going up so much. Why don't we do it? So Saturday comes and they block the road. And nice. Nuria, they go to get Nuria and she's like, oh, I'm going to fucking kill myself. I might as well let them push me into the <laughs> middle of the street. Nuria goes, they protest. They have all these protest signs and everything they made. Uh, the media do turn up. Nuria does these slightly bemused interviews telling everyone she's going to kill herself. And then it gets to the end of the day and the police come on. They say, okay, you've had your fun. Take all this shit down. And the people in Cotty said, well, hang on a minute. You haven't told Nuria she gets to stay. And actually, we want a rent freeze for our entire estate. Once we've got that, then we'll take this barricade down. But until then, we're staying here. But of course, everyone there knew the minute they left the barricade, the police would just tear it down. That would be the end of it. So one of my favorite people in Cotty, a, a woman named Tanya Gartner, she's, uh, Tanya is uh, one of the punk squatters in Cotty. And she's re she wears tiny little mini skirts, even in Berlin winters. She's hardcore. <laughs> Tanya, I know people do that in Newcastle. It's very impressive. Yeah. And it gets even colder in Berlin than in Newcastle. So Tanya went up to her flat and she got her, um, she had a klaxon. You know, those things that make loud noises at football matches. Yep. And she comes back and she says, okay, everyone, here's what we're going to do. We're going to drop a timetable to man this barricade 24 hours a day until we get what we want. Uh, at least two people are going to be manning the barricade. If the police come to tear it down, let off the klaxon and we'll all come down from our flats and we'll stop them. Wow. So people start signing up to man this barricade. People who would never have met, had never met, right? Very unusual mixtures of people. So Tanya in her tiny little miniskirt got paired with Nuria, He's a very religious Muslim in a full hijab. And if I remember right, I think they had the Thursday night shift. And the first few nights that they're paired, they sit there and they're like, this is so awkward. We've got, what have we got in common? Nothing. They just looked away from each other, had this awkward chit chat. As the weeks went on, Tanya and Nuria started talking. They discovered they had something incredibly powerful in common. Um, Nuria had come to Germany when she was 16. She had two babies she just had. And she was meant to earn enough money to send back for her husband in Turkey to come and join her. So she worked unbelievably hard. <clears throat> she worked in a factory. She had a paper round. She did so much work. And after a year and a half, when she'd nearly got enough money, she got word from home that her husband had died. Sitting there in the cold in Cotty with Tanya, she told her something she'd never told anyone in Germany. She'd always told people that her husband had died of a heart attack. Actually, he died of tuberculosis, which was seen as this like shameful disease of poverty at the time. That's, that's when Tanya started to tell Nuria something she didn't talk about very much. 
she had come to Cotty when she was even younger, when she was 15. She loved punk and her parents had thrown her out because they hated that she loved punk. They were kind of middle class family. And she'd come to Cotty to live in a punk squat. And I think six months later, she realized she was pregnant. So Tanya and Nuria realized they seemed so different, but they were incredibly similar. They'd, they'd both been basically kids with kids of their own in this place they didn't understand. They wished they'd met much sooner. They became great friends. These pairings were happening all over Cotty. There was this um, young Turkish German young Turkish German lad called Mehmet who um, kept being told he was going to be thrown out of school. Uh, they said he had ADHD. And he got paired with this super grumpy old white German guy called Dieter who said he, he didn't agree with the protests because he... He didn't agree with direct action because he loved Stalin and he just needed a communist state to impose all this. But in this case, he would make an exception. And they and, and Dieter started helping Mehmet with his homework. Mehmet started doing much better at school. Uh, Dieter became less grumpy. Um, so these pairings were happening everywhere. Um, after the protests had been going on for about three months, so directly opposite Cotty, the, the, the housing estate in Cotty, there's a, a gay club called Zublock. Uh, which had opened about a year before, and it's run by a man I love called Rick Hutchstein, who, who um, how can I explain him? To give a sense of what he's like, the previous place he owned was called Cafe Anal, which I always think, like, you wouldn't want to have a sandwich from Cafe Anal, would you? But So it's a pretty... I mean... <laughs> you know what the Berlin gay scene is like. It's a pretty intense, like, filthy, in yeah. the best sense, uh, gay scene. And when they'd first opened this club, about a year before the protests, a little bit less... Um, you know, some people were really pissed off. There's a lot of very religious Muslims. Some people had actually smashed the club's windows. They've been quite pushed back against it. So everyone at Zublot, this gay club, said, you know, they gave all their furniture to the barricade. And they said, after a while, they said, you know, you guys should have your meetings in our club. We'll give you free food. We'll give you free drinks. And even the lefties at Cotty were like, you know, we're not going to get these really religious Muslims to come and have meetings underneath posters for fisting night, right? It's not going to happen. Um, it did start to happen as one of the Turkish German women there, an amazing woman named Neriman Tanker said to me, we all realized we had to take these small steps to understand each other. So they have these meetings. They actually, the barricade was, because a lot of people who live there are construction workers. They turned the barricade into this permanent, lovely building with like doors and rooms. And um, after the protest had been going on for nearly a year, one day, a guy turned up there called Tunkai. Um, Tunkai was in his early 50s at the time. And it's clear when you meet Tunkai, he'd been living on the streets and he clearly has some kind of cognitive difficulties. And he's got a slightly misshapen palate. Um, but Tunkai had an amazing energy about him. He, he hugged everyone. He was lovely. And after he'd been hanging around for a few weeks, people realised he was homeless. They said to him, you know, you should come and live in this thing we've built. We really like you. We don't want you to be homeless. Come and live here. So Tunkai started to live there and he became a much-loved part of the... Cotty protest. And after he'd been there for about nine months, one day the police came to inspect the, um, they would do this every now and then they would come and inspect the thing they built and, you know, and Tunkai thought the police were arguing with people. He doesn't like it when people argue. So he went to try to hug one of the police officers, but they thought he was attacking them. So they arrested him. That was when it was discovered. Tunkai had been shut away in a psychiatric hospital for 20 years, often literally in a padded wow. cell. Oh my God. He had escaped one day, he'd been on the streets for a few months and he found his way to Cotty. So the police took him back to the psychiatric hospital at the other side of Berlin, I think it was in uh, Charlottenburg. At which point the entire Cotty protest- He's got a family now. Like Exactly. <laughs> it basically turned into a kind of free Tunkai movement, oh. right? So all these people- Amazing. Descend on this psychiatric hospital on the other side of Berlin. And I remember, so yeah, there's these psychiatrists who've got this person they've had shut away for 20 years who no one gave a shit about. And suddenly they've got these very camp gay men, these women in hijabs, and these punks. They're like, what is going on? <laughs> they're just completely baffled, right? But I remember Uli, one of the protesters, Uli Hartman, who's another great person, she, her saying to them, yeah, but the thing is, you don't love him. He doesn't belong with you. We love him. He belongs with us. And I remember thinking, God, how many of us, if, if someone carried us off to a psychiatric hospital, would have like hundreds of people saying, no, 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 we, lo we look yeah, after this person, one not you. Yeah. Anyway, many things happened at Cotty. Um, they got Tunkai back. It took a while. He lives there still. Um, 
that they got a rent freeze for their entire housing project. Um, they then launched a referendum initiative to keep rents down across the whole of Berlin. It got the largest number of written signatures in the history of Germany. Um, there is now a rent freeze in the whole of Berlin. Wow. But the last time I saw Nuria, the woman who'd started all this, I remember her saying to me, you know, really glad I got to stay in my home. That's great. But I gained so much more than that. I was surrounded by these incredible people all along. And I never knew, right? And I remember uh, Neriman, another one of the Turkish German women, saying it's, it really deeply affected me this. She said to me, you know, when I grew up in Turkey, I grew up in a village. And I called my whole village home. And then I came to live in the Western world and I learned that here, what you're meant to call home is just your four walls, right? And if you're lucky, your family. And then she said, this whole protest began and I started to call all these people in this whole place my home. And she said, I realized in some sense, in this culture, we are homeless. You need to feel you belong. You need to feel that people see you and value you. You need to feel that, that people will miss you if you're not there. And in this culture, you know, what we offer people is not big enough to make people feel they belong. It's not a big enough sense of home. The, the Bosnian writer Alexander Heyman said, home is where people notice when you're not there, right? By that standard, a lot of us have a very thin sense of home, right? A very, not one that is not big enough. And I, I remember Tanya, the punk squatter, who I, I just love, Tanya said, one time I was sitting with her outside the block and she said to me, you know, when you're all alone, and you feel like shit, you think there's something wrong with you. But what we did is we came out of our corner crying and we started to fight. And we realized we were surrounded by people who felt the same way. And to me, what was so important about Cotty, I mean, there was so, I think they think I'm just insane because basically what I would do is turn up every few months and just cry and then leave because I found them so inspiring. I remember Sandy, one of them there said to me, because my eyes were water so much while they were talking, he said to me, Johan, do you think maybe you're allergic to something here in Cotty? <laughs> but, the, 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 but, but to me, what I learned in Cotty is what scientists have been explaining to me for so long. You know, the World Health Organization, the leading medical body in the world, has been trying to tell us for years if you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not weak, you're not crazy, you're not in the main uh, biologically broken, you're a human being with unmet needs. All these people in Cotty, think about how distressed they were. You know, Nuria was suicidal. Uh, Mehmet was about to be thrown out of school. Loads of these people were deeply anxious and depressed. Yeah. They didn't need in the main to be drugged or to be pathologized, they needed to be seen. Yeah, they needed to be connected. To. Yeah. You know, the book is called Lost Connections yeah. because they need, they had lost their connections to the things that most matter in life. And I think you can tell that I absolutely love these people in Cotty, but in many ways, these are not exceptional people, right? They are ordinary people who heard the cry of distress. And there is just so much distress in our society, depression and anxiety have been rising every year that I've been alive, and there's lots of things going on, it's not just these factors, but, and of course it's risen really rapidly this year because we've yes, lost so many has. of our connections even yeah. more, thus proving the underlying argument, one of the many pieces of evidence proving the underlying argument that the World Health Organization has been putting, putting forward for years. Um, at some point we have to listen to those things. You know, part of the problem is we've been taught to see our depression and anxiety as malfunctions, right? They're like, we're told it's a biological problem in you and there are real biological com contributions to be sure and I write about them a lot in the book. But we've been taught to think depression and anxiety are primarily malfunctions. They're like a glitch in a computer program. Depression and anxiety are not primarily malfunctions. They're signals. They're telling us something has gone wrong. And that's something we've really got to, we've got to stop insulting those signals by saying that they're signs of craziness or madness or weakness and start listening to those signals and honoring them. Because it's only when you listen to those signals that you can find the actual solutions. So to me, travel is always about, I mean, Cotty is Look a Look how you just got straight back into that. You're like, I'm the meaning about travel because <laughs> we were talking about travel. Well, no, but it, to me, travel is about, when I think about Berlin, I think about lots of things. I think about loads of things I love about Berlin, of course, and the buildings and the history and my friends there but mainly I think about 
those people I got to know, right? To me, travel is about who are the interesting people who have something to teach me in this place that I don't know, right? And how can I get to know them and how can I hear their stories? And so, you know, I travel to lots of places, but to me, that's always the thing I'm trying to home in on. Who can teach me something here I don't know? I love that. I mean, I can listen to you speak so much is amazing uh, and, we, and we've we've still got loads of categories to do oh. i'm going to say for you Jan, that the best thing about travel is well you sort of said berlin but actually it's just getting to know people and you know listening to their stories and just interesting people and they don't have to be as quote unquote interesting they are interesting well, one of the things i think i think you know uh, whatever you know misanthropy is the hatred of human beings and whatever the opposite of misanthropy is i've got I've almost never met a person who wasn't interesting, right? And if someone seems to you to be uninteresting, that's because you're not asking the right questions. Like humans are incredible and infinitely interesting and joyful and, you know, and even when I've, you know, I've interviewed people who've done terrible things, right? I've interviewed, you know, for a previous book I wrote about the war on drugs, I interviewed a guy who'd butchered and beheaded 70 people in the Congo when I covered the war there. I interviewed a warlord who'd uh, recruited thousands of child soldiers. I've interviewed people who've done terrible things. Even they were really interesting. (laughs) And even they actually did terrible things because terrible things were done to them. I don't want to be naive about it. It's it's complicated, isn't it? But everyone has Humans are amazing. And you can anywhere I can travel where I can find humans. There's um, always a story. I'm really interested. I mean, ideally, humans plus McPizza would be the <laughs> ideal, but we're, we're adding I'm that not going to ask That's for we've everything, got. We've right? Got that. Uh, you can't. You know, sometimes life will not give you everything you want. Uh, next up, we're going to be talking film and TV. We'll be right back to find out the best thing to do with film and TV for Johan. But before we do that, we've got the boys at Film Bag. And I think it's Tom's turn to tell us what we should be watching. Over to you, Tom. <laughs> Hey everyone, wouldn't you know it, it's Tom and I'm back with a film bag that's filled to the brim with a ton of movie goodness. This week we're talking about Raya and the Last Dragon, the latest from Disney Animation Studios. The film follows Raya, a princess from the land of Kumandra who has to team up with an ancient dragon to unite her nation's people. Here's a quick clip. Impressive. We could use someone like you. Let's catch you up. My name is Raya. Our lands have been at war for as long as we can remember. Our people never see eye to eye. My daughter, I believe our people can come together again, but someone has to take the first step. Now, in order to restore peace, we must find the last dragon. I wish to join this fellowship of butt kickery. Let's go. Raya is a ton of fun. There is sometimes the worry that these 3D animated Disney flicks all sort of blend together, but Raya maintains a unique sense of style and identity within its traditional Disney format. And identity is at the heart of Raya as it majorly represents Southeast Asian culture in its characters, world, and cast. Kelly Marie Tran and Aquafina are fantastic in the title roles, creating some great interplay between Raya and Sisu the Dragon. I just wish there was more of it. It goes at a breakneck pace, which makes the film fun, fast and frenetic, but at times you do wish you could get a moment to just sit with these characters for a bit longer. I had the opportunity to see the film in IMAX and it looks absolutely gorgeous. Disney continues to push the animated medium forward, especially with how almost lifelike the facial animations are. The standouts are the environment designs, which vary between the different parts of Kumandra, and it's a treat to see where the film takes you next. Overall, I thoroughly enjoyed Raya and the Last Dragon, and it's available now with Disney Plus Premier Access, which is an extra £20 on top of the standard Disney Plus subscription. But if you prefer to wait, the film will become available to all Disney Plus subscribers for no additional costs on June 4th. We'll see you next time for another dive into the film bag. We're chatting TV and film, 2020, 2021 is, uh, you know, years that we're going to look back on. I'm like, I've never watched so much TV and film in my entire life. You were, you said you were like a EastEnders Coronation Street fan. Are you still that? I watched the 60th anniversary episode. Did you watch it? I did not watch it. It I was really like moving. Out. It was. They did a genius, uh, I hadn't watched Coronation Street in a couple of years, but um, they did a genius uh, premise so. Ken Barlow, who uh, people probably know, but he's the only person who's been in the show for the entire 60 years. Um, That's crazy. He knows nothing else. It's, it's biz- I was thinking about that. There can't have been a human. I was thinking about that. Coronation Street must be 
the longest running continuously unfolding narrative in the whole of human history. It's got to be. There can't have, what else would it have been? There would have been stories where they like retold them over 60 years. Yeah. But there can't have been one where it unfold. It was genius. They, were, they did this genius storyline where this evil developer wanted to demolish Coronation Street. And they were trying to stop the developer by getting the brewery uh, a listed building, made into a listed building. So the developer decides to come and demolish the building before they can do that. And Ken Barlow has been out shopping and he comes back and stands in front of the bulldozer like Tank Man in Tiananmen oh, wow. Square and like does this really moving speech about Coronation Street. It was brilliant. It was it's like brilliant. his moment. That's going to be on a show reel, isn't it? It was brilliantly done. It was brilliantly <laughs> done. I don't think he's going to be auditioning for any other parts, but well, he probably doesn't need that show reel. But no, Hollywood next. He might do the, the <laughs> exactly. whole circuit. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to TV and film, are you more of a you know, series person or are you more of a film person? Where, where do you normally kind of hit? I love both. I mean, yeah, I've actually me had this too. weird experience where my first book, um, it's actually been one of the strangest experiences of my life, actually, where um, a book I, I wrote has been made into a, a, a big Hollywood film and it's, it's coming out in February and it, um, wow. it uh, crazily, Variety has tipped it for loads of Oscars. So it's been, so one of the reasons I was in LA mm -hmm. Recently was to see one of the uh, the latest screenings. I've been quite involved. I'm the executive producer as well. It's called The United States versus Billie Holiday, and it's the story um, adapted from my book Chasing the Scream of how the man who launched the war on drugs, a man named Harry Anslinger, basically killed Billie Holiday. And it is a really weird experience to see this story that you wrote and that I uncovered from archives in various other places and from tracking people down, interviewing them made into this like glossy Hollywood film. It's really, it's a really weird It's like experience. a dream come true. It's like, a, it, they, they booked a movie theater in Burbank for me to see a sc screening room. And, and I, I, I felt very uh, emotional because I, you know, Billie Holiday was basically killed by this man because she had an addiction problem and because she stood up to racism. And I can tell you a bit more of that story if you want, but yeah. And, uh, so basically what happened is, I mean, the heart of the story is, so in 1939, um, Billie Holiday walked onto a stage in a hotel in Midtown Manhattan and she sang a song called Strange Fruit that a lot of your listeners will know. Mm -hmm. It's a song against lynching. It's the idea that hanging from trees in the South, there's this strange fruit and it's yeah. the bodies of African-American men who've been murdered. And at that time, this was, you know, regarded as really controversial, right? To have a popular song against lynching. And, and that night, Billie Holiday gets a warning from a man named Harry Anslinger. He basically says, stop singing this song. So Harry Anslinger was a government bureaucrat who ran the Department of Prohibition when alcohol was banned. And then obviously they legalized alcohol again. So he wants to keep his department going. Of course. So he invented the modern war on drugs. In fact, he's the first person to ever use the phrase war on drugs. Um, and he really built the war on drugs around two groups he deeply hated. The first was African-Americans. He was, he was so crazily racist. He was regarded as a extremely racist in the 1920s, right? That's how racist he was. Um, I mean, he used the N-word so often in official memos. His own senator said he should have to resign. And he hated people with addiction problems. When he was a kid, he'd had a problem with someone who had an addiction. And to him, Billie Holiday is a symbol of everything he hates, right? She's an African-American woman standing up to white supremacy. And Billie Holiday had an addiction problem. When she was 10 years old, a man, a 41-year-old man named Wilbur Rich came to her and said, oh, your mother has, uh, I've been sent by your mother to bring you to your mother. So she went with him and he raped her. And he was sent to prison for a year and a half. She was punished much worse. She sent to a convent. They said she was a inverted commas whore. Uh, they said that she'd led him on. I mean, it's just a horrific story. Anyway, she was then um, ends up in a in a uh, brothel, being raped by men for money as a child. Again and again and again. It's it's a horrific story. So she 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 takes this pain and turns it into this incredible genius, musical genius. But also, she's very traumatized. She uses a lot of initially alcohol, then heroin. So Anslinger uses this as a, a way to persecute her. He he hated to employ what um, employ black agents, but you couldn't really send a white guy to follow Billy Holiday everywhere in Harlem. It would have been a bit obvious. So he employed. <laughs> Wait, a man. which one's the agent? Um, the the the, <laughs> the only white guy over exactly. there. Exactly. We're gonna have to change this. No, so no, he no. exactly. So that's why Anslinger employed a guy called Jimmy Fletcher. Uh, it was what's called a bag man. So he basically says to Jimmy Fletcher, follow Billie Holiday everywhere she goes, document her drug use, 
um, and we're going to bust her. So Jimmy Fletcher spends a year and a half following Billie Holiday everywhere. And Billie Holiday was so amazing, he fell in love with her. Wow. And th- that's one of the hearts of the film. <laughs> and then he busts her. His whole life, he was ashamed of what, what happened next. She's put on trial. The trial was called The United States versus Billie Holiday. That's the name of the movie. She said that's how it fucking felt. Um, she's sent to prison for a year and a half. Uh, in prison, she doesn't sing a word. Uh, and when she gets out, the cruelest thing happened to her, which is um, she, at that time, to perform a lot of places where you where alcohol was served, you needed to have what was called a cabaret performer's license. Um, and they make sure she doesn't get it. So uh, in most American cities, you couldn't perform. Um, so one of her friends, Yolanda Bavan, said to me, what's the cruelest thing you can do to a person is to take away the thing they love, right? They take away singing from Billie Holiday. This, by the way, is what we do to people with addiction problems in Britain right now. Instead of when people are down with addiction, helping them up, we give them criminal records, we shame them, we punish them, we make it harder for them to reconnect. In that situation, Billie Holiday relapses. She uh, relapses pretty heavily on heroin. Um, one day she collapses in Midtown, a few blocks away from where she first sung Strange Fruit. The first hospital wouldn't take her because she had an addiction problem. Second hospital took her. She said to her friend, Maylie Dufty, on the way in, they're going to kill me in there. Don't let them. She was convinced that Harry Anslinger wasn't done with her and she was right. So in the hospital, she was diagnosed with quite advanced liver cancer. Um, and we, she, she starts, they, they, they cut off her hair. She obviously can't get any heroin in the hospital. So, they, so she starts going to withdrawal, yeah. which is very dangerous. Sort of cold you, turkey. Sort exactly. Of, yeah. So Maylie managed to insist that she was given methadone and she started to recover. And then 10 days later, they cut off her methadone. Um, Anslinger's agents arrested her on her hospital bed. They handcuffed her to the hospital bed. I interviewed the last living person who'd been in that room, an um, amazing man named Reverend Eugene Callender. They, they handcuff her to the bed. They don't let her friends in to see her. They don't even let her have her record player or her candies. And um, she died. And to me, there's so many important things about this, this story and getting to know some of the people who have been there and, and, and knew Billy. Um, I mean, it tells you what the war on drugs is about. And by the way, what the British war on drugs is about, you know, we have a staggering racial disparities. Basically, almost everyone is arrested for drug dealing in Britain is black, right? Black, which is not because everyone is a drug dealer is black at all. It's because we have deeply racist enforcement of the drug laws, right? Um, the drug laws have always been a pretext for people, the police and the authorities to crack down on the people they want to crack down on anyway, right? Uh, you will have noticed white people use drugs, right? And yet they very rarely get busted for it. Now, that's not an argument for busting more white people. That's an argument for ending this ridiculous war altogether. Um, yeah, because I think that if there's drugs in prisons, there's a wall around the prisons. And exactly. if you can't control that, exactly. you can't control a country. Exactly. You know, if you can't, yeah, that's a brilliant way of putting it. Um, so it's partly tells you what the war on drugs is about all the time. But for me, a more important thing, because one of the reasons I, I wrote my book about this, Chasing the Scream, is because we had... Uh, addiction in my family and, and several people close to me who had very bad addiction problems um, and to me one of the most important things about the, the, this story and why I'm so glad that we've been able to tell it and I'm Lee Daniels who's the director uh, and Susan Laurie who, who wrote the script and, and uh, everyone in the cast done just really fucking amazing job with it is how do I put it that you know no matter what they did to her Billie Holiday always found somewhere to, to sing that song, right? She would go to the worst parts of the Deep South where they threw bottles at her. She still sang that song, right? And in this culture, there's only one heroic story we tell about people with addiction problems, which is that sometimes they overcome their addiction, right? And absolutely, that's a heroic story. And anyone listening who's in that position should be enormously proud of themselves. But that's not the only heroic story about addiction. Billie Holiday never stopped being addicted. She died with her addiction, right? She was still a fucking hero. Uh, the staggering courage that she she showed and all over the world right now people are listening to Billie Holiday and it makes them stronger and all over the world we're still listening to Harry Anslinger and what and following his script and it makes people weaker and I think in a way I mean this is slightly self-aggrandizing and a bit pompous but 
I remember sitting there in, in Burbank and watching this, and obviously I'd seen lots of cuts of the film and commented it before, but I hadn't seen it on a big screen before. And I remember thinking, we have avenged Billie Holiday at some level, right? No, no. You're telling a from, story that people now, don't know. He said, well, from now on, whenever people Google, when after the film comes out, Whenever people Google Harry Anslinger, they will see that he was the person who killed Billie Holiday. And it's taken a long time and it's... Because that wasn't before. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not that some aspects of the story were known before. It hadn't been brought together yeah. in quite this way. Uh, and, 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 and I feel, I feel like, um, I feel like that was a job worth doing. I feel like the, 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 this, this person who showed unbelievable courage and fortitude and bravery, you know, they tried to stop her singing that song and they couldn't. And I, I remember one of her friends, Yolanda, who's herself a brilliant jazz singer. I remember her saying to me when I was researching it, um, I, I asked her, it's always a good question to ask people about someone who's died. I said, what would you say to Billie Holiday if you could talk to her now? And she'd been telling me that, that towards the end of her life, Billie Holiday thought she'd be forgotten and no one would remember her. And she said, I'd say to her, Billy, this morning I went into Whole Foods and they were playing your songs. Nobody forgot you, baby. And and I feel like I'm very interested in stories about people who appear in one moment to be defeated, but are vindicated in the longer term. Because we all get defeated at times in our lives, right? We all seem to be defeated at moments in our lives, right? We all seem to be... Uh, we'll have moments of disappointment and, and, and despair. Like, it's so important. If you think about Billie Holiday, you know, lying there, dying, you know, chained to a hospital bed, um, thinking she'd be forgotten. And you just want to go back and say, no, no. A, no one would have forgotten you anyway. But B, you know, uh, we're going to tell this story from your point of view. That, that And actually, people will look at it. And I think she, at some level she would have known this, actually, from speaking to her friends. But... 65 years from now, however far on we are, um, people will hear this story and you will be the hero and he'll be the monster, right? And I think that that that's a, that should give people hope who are despairing in different ways, that people's perspectives can be radically changed, that, that moments of apparent defeat can become moments of great success and triumph. And she did triumph. She did fucking win. As Lee wrote a great line in the screenplay where she says to Harry Anslinger, you dumb motherfucker, your grandchildren will be singing Strange Fruit. And as we were making the film, people were sending Andra, who plays Billy, and uh, and Lee and other people, um, you know, from the, the, Black Riv- the Black Lives Matter uprising that happened um, in 2020, people kept sending us little videos of people singing Strange Fruit at the protests. And, you know, yeah, she fucking won. No, she did. Uh, it's so funny because um, we're going to be talking about music and uh, next, and uh, but I'm going to take this away from you because I know it's not out yet, and uh, and, I, and I can't wait to see it. And, and when it does, I'm going to put all the links and stuff below so so people do get to go and see it and stuff like that. But I'm just going to say the best thing about TV film is going to be Corey in there, right? Just because we started with it a little bit yeah, Extenders as well, Corey, but yeah. uh, United States, uh, United States against Billy Holiday just. Uh, sounds amazing is it against or is it versus versus versus, versus yeah, yeah, yeah there you go and, uh, United States versus Billy Holiday um, we're going to be talking about music next have you been listening to a lot of music I'm going to pause but uh, you can say yes if you want to hear yes <laughs> I have a bit weird to go no I've never listened to any music no my Spotify in fact, list is this is, is the nothing. first time I've ever heard of the concept of music and they just been no, talking sorry. about Billy anyway uh, next up we're talking about music a little break, we'll be back with Johan telling us his best thing about music. But before we do that, we have the wonderful Bethia Beats. Now, Bethia is an artist in her own right, and she chooses her track of the pod, which we play in full at the end of the podcast. Now, over to Bethia. Oh, you got me alone. Hi, everyone. It's Bethia from Bethia's Beats. My chosen artist for this week is the very, very talented Hannah Dorman. She is a pop rock artist based in Surrey who's been singing and performing for over 10 years. She has been growing a loyal fan base and has hit 50,000 followers on TikTok, over 500,000 plays on Spotify and over 3 million total views on YouTube. Here's a snippet of her gorgeous song Alone playing in the background. To listen to the full song, it will be playing at the end of the podcast, along with the details of Hannah's social media and where you can find the song. Thank you so much, and I will see you next time. I found the light I need. 
Um, you said you've never heard of music. Music is a thing full of notes, and uh, it just lifts people's spirit. I'm joking. Um, Shit. <laughs> Someone said to me that singing is just holding your words for longer. It's just speaking, but just like different, like a weird accent. Hmm. Can you do accents? Are you gonna? You've done a few already. Not very. Well. It's like my. I'm, I'm so bad at singing that when my niece was three. One day she looked at me, I seen to her, and she looked at me and said, Johan, and I said... Are you okay? She, she said, please never sing to me again. What were you singing as to sleep or something? Yeah, and she literally just... And she just said it very, very seriously and Dead very pan. sadly. Like, it was very... It was a very unfortunate um, experience. Yeah. We, my, my niece, who's seven, her name's Ren, and uh, we... You could do this thing on... Uh, uh, on like Echoes or uh, Alexis. I don't want to say that word because now everyone's Alexis. Yeah, okay. going, Hello. Um, but you can do a thing and you can get it just to play random music. And so what I would do is I'll just make it, I'll say, so give me a topic. And she's like this. And I was like, give me like an emotion. She's oh. like this. And then we'll just make up songs together. Oh, that's adorable. Yeah. And she tries to do the staring contest with me. So it was her favorite thing to do a staring contest. And she's like, ready, go. <laughs> and, but she blinks five times like when she's going, go. <laughs> I'm like you're blinking this is I'm not very good at this I'm like, you're not. <laughs> oh, um, back to music so you're not allowed to sing <laughs> well we, it's funny because we were talking in the break about uh, Whitney Houston and your experience your horrific experience <laughs> stress dream like experience with Whitney Houston and it made me think about uh, about um, the most outrageous joke I've ever seen a comedian say oh here we so go it was very shortly after Whitney Houston died after she uh, tragically drowned in a bathtub and I saw Joan Rivers live. Do you remember Joan Rivers? So I was obsessed with Joan Rivers. And Joan Rivers comes on stage and she's crying. She says, I'm sorry. I know you want comedy. I just, I feel so bad about Whitney. I feel so bad. This was in the US and in that very American where I was like, yeah. Yeah, amazing, amazing. And she said, you know, I met Whitney on the red carpet 20 years ago. I've met her many times since. I just, it's so sad. I keep thinking I could have saved her life. You know, she could be here now if I'd, if I'd only done different. And we're thinking she's going to say, oh, I could have got her into rehab. But she says, Whitney asked me to get in that bath with her. And my vagina is so dry. That water would have just gone. And she opened her legs and went, wash, 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 wash. Just what I said, there's no way that bitch could have fucking drowned. And like, a third of the audience... It's like stunned. A third are like cheering. My the microphone things have gone so big because you just speak like kind of quietish, and then it just matter. Everyone's going to have that on their earphones. It I'll turn that down. Absolutely. And people like some people walked out, and Joe was like, boo, "Some people boo, Too much? Like, boo the queen, boo the fucking queen." I love Joe Rivers. But that's what we needed. We needed I love that. Her. Yeah, um, sorry, that was so. <laughs> my association with Whitney. Um, music. What have you been listening to? What is your? What are your go tos? What are your your things that make you feel good about yourself? Or at sometimes just feel cr- rubbish about yourself. I like being in a dark room with Radiohead, not the band. I mean the band. But just <laughs> I would like music. to a dark room with the actual Radiohead. That's yeah, that'd hard. be cool. Uh, the um, Do you know the band The Magnetic Fields? The I do American know. Band? I'm yeah. obsessed with them. Is that is that your is that your? That's go-to? one of my absolute. I just think they're so. Like, for, for people who don't know them, they're an American band led by um, a, 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 the songwriter, is a guy called Stephen Merritt, who they're, they're very um, weird, often quite sad or spiky songs. So uh, if you've never heard them, I would recommend starting with the songs uh, Busby Barkley Dreams, um, The Night You Can't Remember. Um, there's many of those I thought you were my boyfriend uh, there's just loads of really great I'm obsessed uh, Papa was a rodeo uh, the, the, yeah he's, he's j- j- a lot of them are kind of uh, twists so they take something that seems like an obvious choice for a song what would be an example he's got a song about California girls that's kind of riffing on the famous Katy Perry Snoop Dogg California girls but it's about how he hates girls from California right so they're often <laughs> well there's one called when slightly she, satire well there's one where she plays when she play, one called when she plays the toy piano and it starts with this I think the opening lines are you know when she plays the toy piano woodland creatures come to stare and it's about someone playing toy piano and it goes and then she goes, just says yeah um, 
And then it just says, she's ruining her mother's life. She's thrown her life away on this stupid playing the toy piano. And it just takes this twist. And it's all <laughs> sung in this really upbeat tree. So I love the magnetic fields. I've never seen them live. I really want to. I had tickets booked to see them live. And um, I had to uh, be in Vegas. So I had to cancel. Um, so I love them. I love, do you know the band Me First and the Gimme Gimmies? No. So... Me first, the Gimme Gimme are a gay bat. Oh, I assume that, I can't imagine they're heterosexual. It's conceivable. I don't want to <laughs> inaccurately try this gay. So they do hard rock cover versions of songs like "Over the Rainbow" and like just um, "Crazy for You," and they, so they do like screaming hard rock. You would have heard them if you watched. Did you ever watch the American Queer as Folk? Yes. So the, a, a lot of their music is in that. So over the over the rainbow is. No, I was a British fan of Chris Folks. Oh yeah, of course. I watched it with the sound turned down. That if I told my mum that, she I think she'd be upset because she's like, oh. why would you do that? Because I found my mum just watching it as well. She was just like, this is amazing. Oh, Russell T Davies, who wrote that, is like an unbelievable genius. And he did Doctor Who. He wrote years and years, which I thought. Did you watch that? Of course. Well, my friend's it's in it. I, I, I'm going to loosely say my friend, but Russell too. Oh yeah, I know Russell. Yeah. He's lovely, isn't he? He's, <laughs> he's, delightful. he's totally very nice lovely. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the exactly the the it's a Russell is uh, well Russell Toby is lovely, but Ru- Russell T Davies is I think is a genius. Mm. Um, but yeah, so uh, me first and the Gimme Gimmies are amazing. I like we should this. start with their cover. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to put that in the in the in the all the de- details and links below because uh, I think is, that's the nice thing about this podcast because sometimes people just talk about generic things and that's completely fine but I mean on this one people are going to be googling McPizzas um, <laughs> for, for sure but the, yeah definitely in, with new music and stuff like that what were you also, what, do you know the um, oh shit what's he called uh, um, oh why is my brain not working you can say Michael Jackson no Brad Paisley <laughs> he's a country uh, kind no of, I do know but, I yeah. love him so he's a kind of um, progressive country singer he's a, he he sang a song called, uh, well, his most famous song is probably American Saturday Night. But yeah. there's, um, my favorite song is called Welcome to the Future, which is a song, it's really interesting. We think a country, uh, I spend a lot of time in the US and not just, uh, a lot of British people who spend a lot of time in the US basically are in LA and New York. And I, I, lo- I love LA and New York, but I actually spend a lot of time in the middle of the country. Um, and it's one of the reasons why in 2016, I was absolutely convinced Trump was going to win and no one would believe me. And I was like, no, Trump is going to win. Um, but, so um, Brad Paisley is really interesting because we think of country as this very kind of right wing um, genre, right? I mean, not everyone. Dolly Part. I, I once interviewed Dolly Parton. It was amazing. Um, I bet. But the the um, but but actually he's interesting because he's a kind of quite progressive country singer. So Welcome to the Future is a song that he wrote when Obama won. He won. He sang it at the uh, at Barack Obama's inauguration, and it's sort of a country song about how good it is. There's a black president and how that's progress. Everyone should be proud of. Uh, he's politically admirable, but I just really like his music as well. He, he wrote this lovely song. I really like it. I was trying to think about my, my godsons are now 11 and 9, and I've been thinking a lot about masculinity and visions of masculinity and how we teach people to be men. And there's a, a song Brad Paisley does called uh, The Mona Lisa, which to me is like such a great model of like a masculine... Because like, actually a lot of love songs sung by men are sort of like... Um, well, a very extreme example would be Every Step You Take by Sting, mm-hmm. which is actually about, well, it's a deeply Stalking, sinister yeah. song. People have like weddings. I found it very weird. <laughs> it's like fucking hell. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. They should immediately like, nullify the fucking <laughs> wedding if your husband asks for Every Step You Take to be performed at the dance. But, 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 I mean, okay, that's a very, that's a slightly unfair, that's a very extreme example, but a lot of um, love songs, and you know, this is part of love, so it's not wrong that these are reflected in songs, but a lot of them are kind of, about possession and you know your mind now the Mona Lisa is this beautiful song about uh, uh, it's this idea the, the refrain in it is I feel like the frame that gets to hold the Mona Lisa right because he gets to go out with you right and it's very rare you get love songs by men that are just about you're amazing and I'm so lucky I, I think what is the opening line saying like um, I can't remember how it goes but it's basically some men, you know, find that do this, whatever, and some men just find the right girl, and it's this idea that actually, just like adoring a woman is enough, right? Like that, actually, that just uh, being like you're amazing, and I'm really lucky I've got you, is not a sentiment that actually straight men are taught to say in songs no. very often. No. There actually aren't that many songs or like sell that. or sell that well. You exactly. Know. And Brad Paisley's really interesting because he's huge. Um, he's one of the biggest stars in the United States. Um, um and 
it's weirdly uh, country music doesn't export very much. We, I always thought it was bizarre. It's kind of got um, uh, your dad's from Jamaica. I was like, sorry that Jamaicans love country music. It's like the yeah. weirdest form of like. <laughs> I think it's because it's lied back and it tells stories. I think is right, is and I love that. Like, um, do, do you know the? Uh, yeah, I love country music. The the the. Um, the Merle Haggard song, I Started Loving You Again Today, or like, I love what, what a lot of country songs can be really good at, and Dolly Parton is an absolute genius about this. Of course. Is to tell a whole story of a life in three minutes. Think about Jolene, right? Yeah. I feel like I know Jolene, right? Like, I feel like, uh, and, and obviously Dolly Parton is um, extraordinary at that, but like, a lot of country songs are just great at these kind of, um, there's a, um, oh, what's he called? He died. Earlier, he died in early in 2020, I think of COVID. Uh, the guy wrote that um, it's called John something. He, if you want an example of one of his songs, just put Spotify in spite of ourselves, which is about a couple, uh, a kind of ornery American couple. Um, uh, that's a great song. I'll, f- I'll find out what that is because we'll, yeah. we'll have a little pop up uh, and yeah. a little fat chicken. Swap. But there's all kind of like all kinds of music. I, I don't, um, I don't have very high, but I, I don't really get off on classical music or anything. I have quite um, um, broad kind of. I mean, I know fuck all about music. I have quite broad. I think one of the reasons I've got, I've got a fair few friends who are um, kind of successful musicians, and I think one of the reasons why is because I basically don't know anything about music well, you're not meant to it's you know what yeah. i mean you're just, you're just meant yeah. to enjoy it you don't have to be like i'm into the but music. also i'm not even that impressed by their music i'm just like you know i'm like that's fine come back to me when you've written a book do you know what i mean like yeah. the, enjoy that enjoy exactly. it yeah. you've written quite a few uh, we'll get into that very soon okay. as well i'm gonna say the best thing about music for you i mean probably like country but like i think we should give more props to brad Play, paisley yeah, i think that'd love be good brad paisley. yeah i think it's we'll also have... really hot when you is it really him, yeah, I really i'll put the links below for especially yeah. for Mona lisa because that sounds like i haven't even heard it so that's I'll, a I'll lovely song i really like that uh next up we're going to be talking something random do you have an idea for this we we got a yeah. break so you can just you can just yeah. I, I'm, I'm assuming you do yes <laughs> So I have lots of random things I can talk about, but we, um, because I narcissistically, uh, during the film and TV section, talked about a film I was involved in. I love that. I'll talk about some other films. Um, so have you seen Harold and Maud? No. Harold and Maud is one of the greatest films ever made. So Harold and Maud is a film that was made in 1971. And it's about, it, it, it's an insane premise that cannot work. And yet somehow it becomes one of the greatest films ever made. It's about a 17 year old boy who keeps trying to kill himself, who then falls in love with an 80-year-old woman. And it's about the love affair between, a week-long sort of love affair between Harold, the suicidal 17-year-old, and this 80-year-old Holocaust survivor. And he has an 80-year-old's name, though. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an extremely dark comedy. Cat Stevens did the soundtrack. And when it came out, it was literally described as the most disgusting film ever made. And then, and it was absolutely panned everywhere. But there was one movie theatre, I can't remember where it was now, somewhere in the US, that just kept showing it and it became this huge cult. And now it's regarded as like a, a kind of cult classic. Like secret cin- cinema where people dress exactly. up as old ladies and 17-year-olds. Exactly. It's a, re- well, no, that would be a bit dark. But the, <laughs> it's, it's this, it's actually, the thing about Harold and Maud is, it's A, unbelievably funny, but B, it's, um, it's one of the most profound films about death that have ever been made. Is it American? It, yeah. It's a comedy about death. And it's a comedy about... Uh, Harold and Maud is a really profound and beautiful film. Uh, there's a line in it I think about really often. I don't want to ruin anything, so I'll, I won't say the full context. But one character says to another, I love you. And the other character says, that's wonderful. Now go out and love some more. Uh, Harold mm. and Maud is a really great... A really great film. It's a film about why you should stay alive at a very deep and profound level. It's a great film, Harold and Maud. Another film thematically like that, actually, although much more famous, is It's a Wonderful Life. Have you seen It's a Wonderful of Life? Of course. Yeah. Um, so that's a film. I, I've, I was thinking that because last night I was uh, speaking to a friend of mine who I was staggered to read and never, uh, to, to learn and never seen it's a wonderful were life, you jealous but... of them because you knew what they were going to watch yeah and I they like that, hadn't well i feel like that most about casablanca which i think oh, is one okay. of the best films yeah, yeah, yeah. ever made but what I, what I particularly love about casablanca um why i think casablanca is a, 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 like a profound film and not just a great film is casablanca is 
a love story, a really great love story that tells you actually there's something more important than your love story, right? You think about, so um, Rick and Elsa, the, the two central characters in Casablanca, um, I think you can have spoilers for Casablanca because it's... I like, think you can. Those? If you've not seen it yeah. by now. Yeah. Okay, let me, it's, spoiler uh, alert for yeah. Casablanca. Exactly, yeah. But, well, so you know, so, so Casablanca, uh, I won't go into too much of the plot, but Casablanca um, obviously is this completely incredible love story between Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman characters. And yet the film ends with uh, them deciding to part for the greater good of the society, right? It's actually like, you know what? We had our great love story, but something, what's the line he says? You know, something, uh, 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 the w- troubles of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world, right? And That's why I is, didn't say the line because I was going to get it wrong. Exactly. So I, was, I, well, it I might have said it slightly wrong, but, you, but, but, but and, and the thing is, when they say that, that's not a narrative device to make you feel sad. It's true. You watch that and you think, yeah, you had a great love story, but something is more important. And, and, and I don't think anyone is thinking, you know, you know what? You should just fucking jack it all in. Don't give a shit about who wins the Second World War. Don't play your role trying to defeat the Nazis. And just go off. Just you two go off together, right? Actually, that would be a horrendous ending to Casablanca, right? Um, actually, the, the, and I think so often um, we tell these very narcissistic stories. I think about Gone with the Wind, which is the exact opposite. Gone with the Wind is actually these people cast against this hugely important war, the American Civil War. Okay, they were on the wrong side as well, but set that aside. And actually, it just turns into this narcissistic drama about this one whiny, horrible woman. um, And she thinks it's so important. And you're like, fuck you. Like, actually, all these narcissistic things you're bothered about just aren't that important. There's a fucking civil war going on. Like, slavery is going to continue or end based on how this war goes shut up right it's not about you right and i think that's a casablanca is a really important corrective we, we live in such a culture that encourages narcissism where we're all the paparazzi of our own lives constantly displaying ourselves and and actually casablanca is a very profound film about it's not about you you know or rather your story is important but there's bigger things going on right now right and i think that's a message we need to hear i mean that is an answer. Yeah. Have you seen... Um, the other thing I would recommend, the random thing I recommend is, I think you'll probably be at the tail end of knowing what this is referenced to, but I've been watching it with my godsons. Do you remember the TV series Press Gang? Yeah, of course. So Press Gang changed my... I am a journalist because of Press Gang, I'm fairly sure, right? Is it, isn't it one of the guys in that he did uh, Rocket Man and he was... Uh... Yeah, Dexter Fletcher, yeah, who course. plays yeah. uh, Spike in it. Yeah. So... Um, um, so Press Gang, is, for people who don't know it, it's a children's TV shoot series. It was written by Stephen Moffat, who later becomes super famous. He did the BBC Dracula, Doctor well, Who. I'm watching uh, um, uh, Sherlock right now, and he did Sherlock. Exactly, yeah. he did Sherlock. So he's Mark super. Gattis. He's an absolute genius. Yeah. Um, but it's it's the first thing he ever wrote, and it's about a group of teenagers who set up a newspaper called the Junior Gazette. And um, it's have you watched it as an adult? No. It's so dark and so strange and so clever. The dialogue is incredible. Uh, and I've been watching it with my godsons. What is and it on? Can well you, into it. Can you, you, can, it? you can watch it on BritBox or okay, you can buy cool. the DVDs. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, like, this is, I was watching the other day with them and there's a line in it. Uh, like, there's so much great dialogue, but there's one line where, so Spike and Linda are the two central kind of focuses and they have this kind of tempestuous kind of love affair all through the series. And at one point, Linda says to Spike, you know, you and I are held together by a force far more powerful than true love. And he says, what is it? And she says, the need to have the last word. And I just think that is so, I love Press Gang so much. Sounds like most relationships. Exactly. It's, it's actually, it's really, yeah, again, it's like, it tells a lot of profound truths about the world, Press Gang. Uh, so yeah, that's that's random enough, isn't it? That's pretty random. I, I, yeah. I, I really like that. I mean, I, I don't even know where to go with it. So we're going to go with How, Harold and Maud. Um, and then we'll have a bit of wonderful. It's a wonderful life. Casablanca, and then Press Gang on Britbox. Yeah. Fun you, if you watch all, if you've never seen any of those things, I really watch you, and you will just be so happy watching those things. Um, so we've added a question. I don't put on your sheet of paper, oh. and I didn't tell you before. And it, you can just do it very quickly. But I'm going to give refuse. you a bit of a break. No, you can't refuse. Uh, well, you can refuse. I mean, you could just <laughs> you do like a, silence. You could like no. question rape. You're not <laughs> going to force me to answer this, right? What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, I've got a. I've got a big. Pen. Exactly. Do it. Exactly. Um, okay. Um, the question is, and I don't know if you're going to find this hard to answer, but you don't have to make it a long answer. Yaron, what is the best thing about you? I know that's what everyone says. We'll find out after this. Okay. What 
is the best thing about you, Jan? I think I've already said it in this interview. <laughs> Actually, slightly arrogantly, I've already said the best thing about me, which is that I, I really like people and I'm really curious. I think probably the best thing about me is my curiosity. I'm genuinely curious about most things and most people. Um, so I would probably say in my defense, I'm, I'm curious, I like people and I work hard. Those are the, I mean, there's a huge number of insufferable things about me and very aggravating things about me um, and unlikable things about me, but... I feel like I need to just step in and just like, no, there isn't. No, 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 there's not. It's plenty more like everyone. I'm not <laughs> yeah, saying, I don't course, think I'm more course, than yeah. everyone else, but but I would say, um, yeah, I, I really, really like people. I think people are really interesting, I think. And one of the like crazy things about the kind of life I get to have because of because I'm a writer is you get to just meet just such a crazy mixture of people and I'm just constantly blown away by how articulate people are and how like if I think about in the last 10 years I've spent time with hitmen for Mexican drug cartels the Amish um people who live in the tunnels the drainage tunnels underneath Las Vegas um uh Noam Chomsky one of the greatest geniuses ever lived um like, I could just go through a crazy list of people. Daniel Johnson from The X Factor 2009. I mean, yeah, I mean, I wasn't going to mention the, the one person who made me hate humanity. Top but of the list. The, but, you know, okay, if you insist, I mean, bring it up. I want to say that the man who beheaded 70 people in Mexico <laughs> did not kill my faith in humanity, but you have managed I'm to. I'm so sorry for that. I'm well, so sorry. It's very unfortunate. What can I say? But the... Um, At least but, I made the list, Actually, though. I didn't tell you this. I, I, you're, you're only the second person I can ever say this to in my whole life. Okay. I voted for you. No. The other person I've ever said that to is Tony Blair. I thought you were going to say Jim Davidson and their big brother or something. What? <laughs> you thought I had voted for Jim Davidson? No, I'll just hit myself in the mouth. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, can I... Well, thank you very much. Catherine Tate said the same thing and I, I, oh. I, I sell a tape to pound to a card oh, that's to nice. say thank you. So. That's nice. She's nice, Catherine Tate, isn't she? I like her. Wonderful. She's yeah. a wonderful She's human a great, being. Great very, person. Very normal. You know yes. what I mean? Like, yeah, for being to, uh, in this world that she put herself in, she's relatively quite a normal, normal person. You were talking about The Crown before, I think when we were off, off mic. And, yeah. Um, Not that we talk off mic, obviously, we I, just sit here in silence normally. I'm slightly obsessed with Gillian Anderson's performance as Margaret Thatcher, aren't you? It's kind of incredible. I've going to put my hand up, not seen a single episode. <gasps> and the main reason why is because... I've just been binge watching and rewatching Game of Thrones, so oh, I haven't had. Right. To, it's just been caught in the middle of that. It's so strange. You should watch some of the clips. I love Gillian, though. Your Majesty, <laughs> there's no dignity in the wilderness. They're saying that they're being mean to to the, in 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 the Crown that they said that the royal family are mean to Margaret, but they said that actually isn't real because obviously the Crown is is not real. Well, if you, are you I've met Gillian Anderson. Have you? She's. It's, I, I I no. I mean, I watched really them before. So when I met her, it's very interesting. I met her at a party once. Um, uh, it was like one of those slightly surreal parties where like it was like being at Madame Tussauds because everyone was famous. You were just like, what the fuck is this? But <laughs> she is genuinely one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. Her skin. Yeah. She literally looks like a newborn baby. The makeup artist must go, um, nothing. <laughs> it was insane how beautiful she was. Like, And it wasn't the beauty that you get of being... Because you know that thing where often you look at people who... I better not say who, but there was someone else at that party who's quite famous who looks very good on camera yeah. and actually in the flesh looked dread like looked we'll, well, didn't look dreadful just looked odd we will allow the listeners to just make up their own minds exactly they can just say, be... whoever you're thinking right now that's who you're exactly. but, but, but uh, Jim Anderson it was actually as a fully gay man I was literally transfixed was it by Amanda Holden I'm joking <laughs> I felt like I felt like I Joan... don't think anyone would she doesn't look good on television so it would <laughs> obviously I mean like don't get me wrong I don't want to diss Amanda Holden but she well Joe Lysett does it a lot anyway so it's fine well I mean I just feel actually sad and it's we shouldn't criticise Amanda Holden because it's no I like that's Amanda that's what I like Amanda that's what misogyny and women not being allowed to age does to you like did you watch The Undoing the thing with Nicole Kidman and Hugh Grant of course so it's really interesting isn't it because if, if you were just to see a still image of Nicole Kidman great she looks great but actually there's a slightly muppety quality to her face wasn't there by the time because she can't she literally can't move her face uh, we just need to just tell it's people they sad. don't need to do stuff Hmm? You, we just need to tell people they don't need to do stuff. Yeah, but so we're men. We can. We can. And also, you're 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 not going to age like you're not going to look old, are you, Daniel? Because just you've got naturally fresh 
kind of. And it's I naturally drink laser like a colored Down syndrome well, baby. So <laughs> you are very fresh faced, by the way. Right, thank you. That's the fine. Um, the but do, do you know what I mean? Though we we we've got the privilege that we don't have to. Oh no, we don't. Yeah. We don't. We won't get dismissed if we look our ages. I can whereas, have the most hairy legs, and no one gives a crap. You know what I mean? Like exactly. I don't well, have I to. Be slightly around. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I don't really understand why we we make people do the things that they have to do to look a certain way. And I, and then I realized because I'm a man and, and that's not what is expected of me, but it's so weird that that we seem to think we're so moved forward. And now we're off topic anyway, cause I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you what you're up to next, but we look forward and stuff and be like, Oh, we're, we're so much better. And we are so much better as, as a civilization. But at the same time, we still make women do these things things like femininity doesn't really exist you know what i mean in the sense yeah. like we've just made it like you have to do i i think someone said if men could get pregnant there would be like things in beer to make you not get pregnant <laughs> that, there'd be contraceptives in beer it's and true. toast you know what I mean? it's true. <laughs> it is the hardest thing um okay thank you so much you've been uh, I, i've had to hold yeah. it in the whole time and uh, because i am a super super fan i've oh. listened to so many wonderful things i've read uh, a, a couple of your books and stuff i'm so excited when i messaged you um, you said you were writing another one. I was like, yes. I was more excited about that than oh. you actually. I mean, I was totally excited that you would do this. Um, but um, uh, big shout out to my mum who loves you as well. But oh. hello, Daniel. What's your mum's name? Maria. Maria. Oh, oh my God, she's gonna, Sorry. she's gonna. Oh, actually, that. I was thinking more. What's the eighties song? Maria, <laughs> you gotta see her. Is that we're gonna end yes. the podcast on? Love that song. Uh, what are you up to next? Uh, what is happening? I mean, you've already told me a couple of things, but you've got a new book. You've got a film coming out. You've got. So I've got a book that was due to come out in January, um, twenty twenty one, but obviously because of the plague in the end of the world, yep. we decided to delay we put for it back. year. So it's that's a book about why we're having so many problems focusing and paying attention and what we can do about it. Uh, not unrelated to what you said about TikTok. Um, and um, my book after that will be about a Las Vegas and something that I'm not meant to talk about in relation to Las Vegas. And I'm working on a documentary um, about uh, something I'm not meant to talk about. Uh, and there's uh, and the film, uh, United States vs. Billie Holiday, coming out. And there's also a documentary of my first book, Chasing the Scream, that's been made. Wow. That will be out uh, sometime in 2021. And I feel like there's something I'm forgetting that um, I'm working on. Um, yeah, so those are my main that is my main hustles. That is a that is a lot. I mean, you are one of the hardest working people that I've I've oh. been following following your journey for for, for absolutely ages. And uh, like I said, I'm a huge fan. I uh, I re-listened to um, your Richard Heron interview. I re-listened to your Joe Rogan interview. I listened to multiple other ones that I found, um, and just I could listen to you talk and your stories. And oh. uh, and it's so funny. You tell a story, and and I feel like are oh, people being insincere when they tell a story? You go through it like. Every some of the stories you told today, I I, I knew, and I still was just like in trance because you felt every moment of the story that you told, and that that is a true talent, you know. Not only just writing this and going and doing, telling it, you telling it, and I just think it's um, yeah, you are an inspiring person, and 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 I'm looking forward to just seeing what happens now. I don't I don't even think you started. I don't even think you started with what you're gonna do, and I um, you. It's going to be interesting to see what happens in the next sort of 30, 40 years. Because I think oh. people are going to look at you and be like, yeah, well, he's the man. Um, oh, thank so you so much. I'm now going to say to you what Whitney Houston said to you, which is, <laughs> that's not good enough. Do it again like I do it. And that's a perfect way to finish the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for the thank yous. I want to say a massive thank you to you and Harry for being a wonderful guest and being that person that I've just been so inspired by. Thank you to Adam Harris giving us his fat chicken to find out the answer right after this. Bethia Beats bringing us the best in brand new music and her track of the pod will be played right after Fat Chicken. Thank you to the boys at Film Bar making sure we don't miss out on those must see films. The music in the background is by Tom Baxter, Jimmy Lundy, and myself. The artwork is done by JMD. And that's all from me. Next up is Adam Harris's Fat Chicken Answer and then followed by Bethia Beach track of the pod. See you next time. What's up, y'all? Fat Chicken, cluck, cluck. I was finding out whether... Um, oh, there's a lot of us that are allergic to cats, but apparently some cats are allergic to people, and that is actually true. It's unbelievable. Um, it's quite uncommon apparently, due to the fact that we bathe ourselves more often than other species, particularly cats who think licking themselves is a bath. Um, 
and we don't shed as much hair and dead skin, but it does happen. Some cats are allergic to humans. Another one of those for you next time. Cluck, cluck. <laughs> Why can't I ever stop if I'm all that you want but never good enough? Whoa, oh, oh. you want me alone. And I know all you said is that you needed time, but as well as time, give a little sign to show. You want me alone. But I found the light, I needed you to shine. Can't say I love. Say I love. There are things that I thought about. There are words that I can't say I love.